All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Illumine our hearts, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, and plants this also the fear of thy blessed commandments. The trampling down, O carnal desires of enter spiritual manner of living, both thinking, both thinking and doing such things as are well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and unto thee we ascribe glory, together with thine unoriginate Father and thine holy good and life giving spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. All right. So here we are. Oh, hello. You're fine. Hi. Hi. So Deb is with us. <laughs> All right. So Q&A part two. The next time we gather, we're going to start Orthodoxy 101. So that'll be fun. All right. So um, today's Q&A. Anyone have any questions? You can ask me. Okay. Well, we talked about Jesus being God, but why is it so important to believe in? I got this why, down, why? Okay, um, so we already have a question. So the question is um, that we said it's important that Jesus is God. So why is it necessary for us to believe that, right? Because of all the other things, him calling his father and sitting in his right hand. And well, but I mean, the first is because he is. Okay. Yeah, that's what you say. But um, well, no, I mean, it's what the Gospel do, of John I says. Mean, that's what we say, but why is it so important? Because to... the Gospel of John says so. Okay, that's that's part of it, okay? Like I said last week, in the beginning was the Word. This is the very first section of the Gospel of John. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, so with God implies the relationship between the Son and the Father, that he's with the Father, Right. But then it immediately then turns around and says that it is God. So we have two various parts that still are God. Okay. So father is God. And then the, the word that we're talking about is also God. But the word then later on in the gospel of St. John says the word became flesh. Okay. And became incarnate. Okay. So not only then is it that he is in this divine relationship with the father, but he also incarnates, he takes on flesh, he becomes human, okay? So we have both of those things. Now, there's another <laughs> thing to this too, and that is that why is it necessary for him to be God? Um, Saint Gregory the theologian says, that which Christ did not assume he did not save. Say that again. That which... Christ or God did not assume he did not save. So he became fully human, even though he was God, so that humanity could be restored to the way he's supposed to be. Okay? Because when we have the fall, when we fall, that aspect of our existence went away. Okay. It um we be Adam and Eve would not have died. They actually could not die. It was a physical impossibility for them to die until they ate the apple, the yeah. tree, from the yeah. tree, okay? But once they did eat from the tree, then they became, as we say, subject to corruption. They get old. They either die of old age or of an accident or of a murder, as Abel was, <laughs> okay? But they die. Everyone dies, okay? And so Christ... Um, there's there's one more thing to this too. So Christ assumes all of humanity to perfect it again, to bring it back to the way it's supposed to be, okay? Including death, okay? Had he not sampled death, then we would still have that one thing that was not brought into his care, okay? But then after he dies, there's another aspect. His death sends him to the realm of the dead, just like everyone else before Christ went into the realm of the dead. OK, and we have that picture of Christ in Hades pulling Adam and Eve out of their tombs. Right. Well, that is the realm of the dead. OK, so that big icon that we have in our <laughs> sanctuary where Christ is pulling them out and there's everyone around him. That's the realm of the dead. That's not heaven yet. It's close, but not quite. OK, so the devil thinks that the son isn't God. He just thinks that he's the son much loved by the father, but still not God. So the devil is tricked, okay? <laughs> He's tricked into bringing God into 
his domain where he was suffering, causing people to suffer and be tortured and be, you know, unhappy and all of that. Okay. So he takes, um, he takes on Christ thinking that he can cause the father grief. What's the best way to get to, okay. So if you want to hurt you, what do you do? You hurt Norma? No, you hurt your daughter or your son or your grandchildren. Right. right? And so the devil thought, the best way to get at the father is to take the son and torture him. Okay. Well, sorry, but the son is also God. So he can't contain him. Can't do it. Okay. So we have that great image of the gates being broken and the locks all being shattered and the devil being bound and everyone being pulled out of their graves because Christ has triumphed even over death, even in that domain. Okay. And so he then takes them and brings them into light where there is no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more sighing, no more death, no more darkness, no more war, no more aggression, no more envy, no more greed, no more any of that stuff. Okay. Make sense? Pretty cool when you think of it that way, right? Well, Makes you want to have Pasca. Let's go to Pasca. What's that? Kind of proved it was the devil. What do you mean? Because he couldn't get to the sun. Yeah, the image that they actually use is the devil. Um, his stomach was embittered, <clears throat> and and the phrase there when you say Hades was embittered. Um, what do you do if you eat something that's bad and you're supposed to deal with it? You take syrup of Ipecac, right? Or at least you used to. And what does that do? It makes, makes you throw up. up. Yep. Yep. That's the image. Christ is the devil's syrup of Ipecac. Literally. That's the image that they use in the, um, even what when St. John does his sermon, you know, the Paschal sermon, no priest is allowed to preach on Pascha because we have to read St. John's sermon. And it says, <laughs> Hades was embittered when it beheld thee and, and it just goes on and on and on. So the embittering there is literally um, Hades can no longer contain that which it thought it could hold, the sun and everyone else, all creation. And so it it literally vomits it up. I know that's really ugly, but that's that's the term, okay? And, and there's nothing really wrong with it. It's the image that's appropriate. Hades cannot contain anything anymore. It's in, in, insufferable appetite is brought to nothing because it thought it met a man who was the son of the father and he encountered God again, right? Basically from the, the sermon of St. John. Yeah. So that's why those three basic things, the one is according to the gospel of St. John and the emphasis that we have on the, the word taking on flesh okay so that that's part one and then that which christ did not assume he did not save that's part two and then part three is in going to hades he delivers all from death and the only being capable of doing that is the one beyond all beings and that's god you know we can't save ourselves from death right only god can deliver us from death but it's a great question and let's be honest, the majority of Christians throughout the world don't really understand that. Okay. Yeah, I, know. What's going on. I was going to say, that's probably why you asked the question, because there are many Christians who do not believe that Jesus is God. Um, they think he's a really nice guy. Thomas Jefferson didn't think he was God. He wrote an entire gospel where he stripped out all the miracles because they're unprovable. And then, and then he, you know, just assumed that everyone... Because, you know, in those days, um, you know, in the time of the Enlightenment, and America is very much a project, a product of that Enlightenment, um, they only believed in things that could be verified by repeating the process, okay? The scientific, so-called scientific method, all right? So if you want to prove gravity, I can prove it right now. There you go. Gravity works, okay? And you can do that over and over and over again, okay? Um, <clears throat> but when it comes to any miracle that Jesus performed, go ahead, you know, repeat it. How does that work? And it doesn't, right? So, um, so the founding fathers would say, or not the founding fathers, but the product of the enlightenment would say, see that that's 
improvable, so we're not going to include it in what we do. Yeah, because they were smart. Not really, but I mean, that's that's what they believed. I mean, they were certainly very smart, but maybe a little, um, a little too much dependent on their own intelligence. Great. Do you have a question? Can you do me a favor and show the icon that you showed me? Um, show it to them. I'm going to put it online so that people can see it here. If I can get it the right size here. Um, I'm terrible. <clears throat> Oh. Yeah. Oh. So bear with me in video land where I switch things over here. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so um, this is not the same image, but um, it's close to the image that I was shown um, on Sunday. Well, you found something similar? I did. Oh, good. Let me show us. Okay. I wish I, I should have just printed out a copy, you know? <laughs> Oh, okay, I, yeah, this is slightly different than yours, but that is exactly, okay. yeah, that's it. You okay. said you were going to tell me what the animals you Yes, I am. We're going to talk about, about that right now. Switch. Yeah, now I do. Okay, so um, in the icon that Deb is showing me, it's the mother of God with Jesus in her lap, surrounded by all sorts of other mm -hmm. heavenly hosts. And there are, um, in the, the same, what you're seeing there, you're seeing um, in the icon that I have, see, slightly different. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 All right. Um, so there are um these animals. Well, one's an a, a man or an angel, but there are other there are three other animals that are um holding on to um a gospel. Okay. So what are those? Okay. So here's what they are. So the first one, the angel in the upper left hand corner is the gospel of St. Matthew. Okay. It's the gospel of St. Matthew because in the gospel of Matthew, you have the emphasis on the humanity of Jesus. Okay. Number one, the, um, the, the story, the, 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 the lineage. Okay. The genealogy that you have where it starts with Abraham and it runs all the way through to Joseph and then to David or to, excuse me, then to Jesus. Okay. Now, Luke does it too, but Luke emphasizes other things. So there'll be another animal that depicts that. Okay. But throughout it all, the prophets are always saying this is going to happen. And in the Gospel of St. Matthew, you always have. And this is because the prophet Isaiah said this. And this is to fulfill the prophecy of Joel or whatever it is that you have. Um, so you have in that particular corner, you have uh, the Gospel of St. Matthew. Okay, the next one, the lion, is the gospel of St. Mark. Okay, why? Because in Mark, you have a particular emphasis on the royalty of Jesus. Royal, you know, lions are a royal figure. If you think about <laughs> a symbol of Great Britain is a lion, right? Regal, very regal. So you have the royalty of Jesus there. Um, the calf or the ox which is at least in the icon that I have here, yeah. that's the gospel of St. Luke. Okay. Why St. Luke? Because St. Luke's gospel emphasizes the sacrificial nature of Jesus. Okay. The emptying of himself. It's in the gospel of Luke where you have the reference of um, <clears throat> him in the garden of Gethsemane, praying so profusely that it's like drops of blood are coming off of his body. Okay. Okay. Um, and you also have um, the whole story of John, the forerunner. It talks about Zacharias. Zacharias is a high priest, okay? And so Zacharias and Elizabeth are the parents of John, the forerunner. So if Zacharias is a priest, so is John, okay? So because you inherit the priesthood from your father, okay? So 
you then have that particular thing. If, if you're male, you do. I mean, um, I think um, Joachim was also a priest, but because it's Mary and not a male, there's no Levitical connection there. Okay, so the, the um, so in the Gospel of Saint Luke, you have these connections to the sacrificial nature, and uh, you know, if you think about it, an oxen is or a calf is one of the perfect symbols for sacrifice, not just in the Hebrew tradition, but also in the Greek. Okay, so in both cases, you have the animals being sacrificed to appease either God or a deity. So there you go. Okay, and then the final one, of course, since there are only four would be the eagle and being John, okay? And in that, you just have, um, because John is a theological gospel, um, it really isn't one that, I mean, basically, the gospel of St. John ends with the beginning, okay? He says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, but all of that points to the fact that God needed to come for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to die, Okay. And in all the things that, that John talks about, everything is seen with a post vision of the resurrection. Okay. So it's not something, you know, in, in all the others, it's Jesus leading up to his crucifixion, death, and resurrection. Okay. Um, even in the Gospel of St. Luke, he sets his sights towards Jerusalem. Okay. But he still is in progress towards Jerusalem, okay? Even though all four of them are speaking from a post-resurrection perspective, it's really the Gospel of St. John that talks about it most directly. Um, and so there are some, again, Christian traditions that point to the Gospel of St. John to say, oh, it's a Christmas story. No, it is not a Christmas story. It is a Pascha story. Okay, beginning and end is a Pascha story. Okay, so... Um, these symbols for, you know, man, lion, calf, and eagle, those have been in the Christian tradition uh, pretty much from the beginning, okay? Now, here's another interesting side note. If you look at the prophecy of Ezekiel, it describes what a cherub looks like because he sees these great wheels in the sky. Those are cherubim, Okay. In the gospel, or excuse me, in the prophecy of Isaiah, you have reference to the seraphim, okay? The seraphim are the ones with the six wings, okay? We have them depicted in our church, okay? They, you know, when you depict them, it looks like a head surrounded by red wings, okay? Some are up here, some are out to the sides, and some are down underneath, okay? Well, with a cherub, it's a lot harder to depict them. Number one, they have eyes everywhere, so not just on the heads, but they have eyes everywhere. So they have these wheels and in each corner of the wheel, north, south, east, and west, is a, a man, a lion, a calf, and an eagle. Okay? So it's really meant to convey that whole uh, image. And so there's that linear um, consistency between what you see in the form of a cherub from, Eze from Ezekiel that then goes into the four gospels that you have in our church. And I'll be honest, um, I, I'm thinking having four Gospels is intentional. There are other Gospels that exist, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Nicodemus, the Gospel of uh, um, of James. There are all sorts of different, even their Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Peter. And, and all of those, in varying degrees, they may be worth looking at. But, you know, some of them, some of them venture too far into heresy. Some of them don't really talk about Jesus at all. Some of them are just complete sidetracks. They talk about one specific thing that happened in Jesus' life, and then they don't talk about anything else. The Gospel of Nicodemus is really important. Um, the first <laughs> part is because it's just a conversation between Pilate and Jesus. Okay, But the second half of it talks about Christ's time in Hades. It's really remarkable. you know. And I'm surprised that we don't know it better in our own tradition, because it's basically everything that you hear in the Paschal Liturgy is in this document including the pounding on the gates, if that you know, gates all you everlasting, and that the king of glory may enter in. I don't have it memorized, but you know what you do outside when you're like banging on the door. It's out of the Psalms, but it's right there in this gospel. Pretty cool. Okay. And we know Joachim and Anna because of the Proto-Evangelion of St. James. 
Okay. We don't know it from the gospels, but we, that whole story is the life of Mary. How do we know that she was presented to the temple? That gospel of St. James. How do we know how Zacharias died? Gospel of St. James. A lot of that. Although you hear, excuse me for rambling, but you hear alluded to, again, in the gospel of St. Luke, where Jesus just rails at the Pharisees at, at their, um, I think it's in Matthew 2, but they, 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 he rails at them because they say, well, if we had been alive when our fathers were, we wouldn't have abused the prophets. And he knows they're lying. He knows they're lying. And he said, look at you. You've been participants in murder from the time of Abel to the time when blood was spilled in the altar. To Zacharias, whose blood was spilled in the altar, A to Z. Now, that's our convenient A to Z. It's not theirs. Greek, the Zeta isn't the last letter in the Greek alphabet. But the point is, you go from Abel, the first to die, to someone that they had the audacity to kill in the sanctuary, okay? In the holiest place in the whole world, they killed somebody because he refused to divulge where his son was. And this is all told in the Proto-Evangelion in St. James. So our Lord makes allusion to it, okay? That Zacharias was butchered in the altar, Okay. But we only know about that story in its detail through the Gospel of St. James. It's pretty cool. So I think the four are meant to be there because of the four that um, were in the prophecy of Ezekiel. They are speaking to him. Okay. You know, they're not just there up in the sky being intimidating. They're saying words to him. And so you have that continuity into the four Gospels of the New Testament. All right. Okay, we can... Stop. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. <clears throat> you said that um, this is a very early understanding, these this four representations. Right. Where did, where did they come from? I mean, it, they seem pretty... It just, it just seems like a, a stretch, and I'm wondering how it got developed. Do we know? Well, I'm sure the stretch is exactly what... A, a, um, I mean, look at it this way, okay? The Bible that we have, all right, um, it did not come to be what it is for a very, very long time, okay? Jerome, um, who really is one of the first to actually present the bible as we have it now saint jerome is in the what sixth or seventh century that's a long time ago but it's it's a long time after jesus's life too so we're talking hundreds of years all right and and part of that is because there's no consistent vision about what should be in the bible and what's not in the bible okay the book of revelation that is a really tough book it's a really tough book, and it and it it takes a lot of work to figure it out. In fact, we probably haven't figured it out. All right, um, Hollywood thinks it's figured it out. A lot of televangelists think they figured it out, but they haven't. All right, and even in the time of Jerome, that's a controversial decision to keep the Book of Revelation in the canon of the Scripture. Now, remember, the canon of the Scripture is not saying that that those are the only documents that we pay attention to. Okay. We pay attention to a lot of things. Like I just said, two other versions of the gospel I just mentioned, and they're both very important because they're part of our life, okay? All right, with all that said, I think they're looking back to Ezekiel, okay? And they see okay. this thing with four heads. Each head is is saying um, something similar yet different. They're attached to each other, so they're speaking about the same thing but each one has a different way of presenting it, okay? And yes, I mean, you could say that Luke has a genealogy in it, so you could say Luke is a man, you know, why not make Matthew something else? But um, I think just for the purposes of um, saying that they're different and maybe giving a little bit of a sense of what those Gospels are all about, I mean, it makes sense to say that Matthew is a man because like i said i mean you have all those prophecies that saint matthew said um you know have been fulfilled in the life of jesus okay so you have that and then you also have um the um 
the royalty in, in, in Mark. I mean, the thing about Mark is there's very little downtime. Okay. Mark's gospel goes from point to point to point to point to point to crucifixion to death to resurrection. And that's it. I mean, it, it's 16 chapters. It's extremely, extremely brief. Um, Luke, Luke deals more with earthy things. Um, and like I said, the idea of the sacrifices and things, he, he points a little bit more to the sacrifices than any of the other gospels. And then the eagle, the eagle is the toughest. And I, I don't have the exact depiction because I just read it kind of quickly, but um, it is having to do with the fact that in the gospel of St. John, if you think about it, the half of the thing goes from the garden of Gethsemane to his resurrection. Okay. Half of John's gospel is about the passion. Okay. Um, and I don't know, eagles are seen as powerful and majestic, and Jesus is very powerful and majestic in the gospel of St. John. You know, think about it. I mean, he, even in his discussions with Pilate, in every other one, he's humble and he's, you know, he, he's the suffering servant. He, he just takes it. In the Gospel of St. John, he goes into these discourses with Pilate and says, if I wanted to, I could send legions of angels and they would deliver me from all of this. But this is necessary that it, you know, to fulfill, um, you know, what's to come. It's, it's, you know, Jesus is so much more divine in the Gospel of St. John than he is anywhere else. And if you think about the stereotypical eagle, the eagle is one of the most majestic animals that we have, you know, even though in reality, I mean, they look majestic, but, you know, as Ben Franklin said, you're probably better off with a turkey as our national emblem as opposed to a <laughs> to an eagle. Eagles eat, you know, animals that other animals have killed. Carrion birds sometimes. I mean, they do other things too. I mean, they're, and they're but they, but they look majestic. And they fly fast and they're powerful and they're beautiful. Just like the gospel of St. John. He's be it's beautiful and it's powerful. And it, you know, and it gets to the point. Did that thank answer you. your question? Okay. Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, what other questions? You got one? Yes, yeah, sort of. Um... Jesus died for our sins. Right. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. The West gives that reason. Right. We don't stop there, do That's we? That's right. No, we don't. All right. So he died for our sins, but the bigger part was he destroyed yeah. that. Yeah. Right. Yes. They don't look at it that way. Right. Because I read that they call it substitution atonement. Right. All right. Because he died, we because he died, that forgave all of our sins. Right. But that still doesn't negate the need for confession. Right. So it quite it doesn't make sense to me. Okay. He died for some of our sins, but not the future sins, <laughs> but the ones in the past. But you follow what I'm saying? I think I do. But look, um, Okay, let's do a couple of things. I mean, this takes an introduction, okay? Remember very carefully that in the different traditions, in the West versus us in the East, we have a very different way of interpreting the human condition, okay? Origin That's yes. where we start, okay? okay? Original sin. Original sin. Okay, this is where we start. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it's crazy that everything depends on one verse but how you view humanity is completely dependent on how you choose to interpret that and before i go on i want to say the problem is a mistranslation from greek into latin okay saint augustine didn't come up with it but he certainly bought into it okay the question is this do we sin and therefore we deserve to die? Or do we die and because we die, we, we sin? sin? Okay. Do you get the difference? 
it's subtle in a sense, but it completely changes the way we see God and the way that G- the necessity of Jesus, all of that. It, Could it, you say it again, Father? I will. Excuse me. Okay. Jesus. So the first one is, do we sin and therefore deserve to die? Or do we die and because we die, we sin? That wasn't the we case. sin S I N or at oh, right. let me let me elaborate. Okay, look at it this way Is God a judge who from your birth sees you as deserving death? Okay, because you were born in sin. All right, or were you born to die? All right, which we are born to die. Okay. And because we fear death so disproportionately, we do things to try to save ourselves without depending on God. Okay. All right. You get what I'm saying? Okay. This is the difference. In Roman Catholicism and in Presbyterian Calvinism, okay, and a couple of others, but in those two particular strains, the view is that man is basically evil and needs God to remove the evil. Okay? So Christ dies on the cross to remove that evil. Without Christ dying on the cross, man would continue to be evil and therefore unable to be saved. Okay? So when you hear that Christ died for your sins, then you see very clearly that for them, that's the only thing that's necessary. If he dies so that you don't have to be condemned, then you're basically, you get your golden ticket and off you go. Okay. What about us? How does that work for us? Father, you're really breaking up the audio. It's oh, really breaking up. And I, don't I, know why. I wish I could help that. Hold on a second. Um... I might lose you. If I do, I'll try to reconnect. Okay. I can see what's going on. How about now? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. She said yes. Okay. Okay. Well, I couldn't hear her the first time. Oh, I forgot the wrong one. Hold on. Let's try it again. How about now? Nope. Wow, it's taking forever. Oh no. Come on. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 You're good now. Finally. Okay. Sorry about that. There, I had to restart something. Okay. So, um, the the premise is how you view human nature. Okay. If we just are born to die, which is a much more existential situation, because it's obviously verifiable. Okay. You know, are we born evil? I mean, is a baby evil? I mean, baby's insufferably selfish. Yeah, it wants to survive. <laughs> so it's going to want to nurse. It's going to want to sleep. It's going to be have its diaper changed. I mean, it's going to be really selfish, but does that make it evil? No, not at all. Okay, so, I mean, the one you can already see the flaw in it. Okay, but then you go on to the necessity of Christ. Okay, when we come to communion, one of the first things that we do right before communion is we confess. I believe, O Lord, and I confess that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then we make this promise that we're not going to reveal the secrets to traitors. And we're not going to be like Judas and give a kiss and all those things. It's to make sure that the state of our soul is as cleansed as it can be. Even before that, we turn around and I say, Christ is in our midst. And you say he is and ever shall be. That's a passing of the peace to make sure that we're all reconciled with one another, okay? And not at war with each other. Because if we're at war with each other, if we're fighting, don't go to communion. 
don't go. Okay? Because that's bad. You know what I mean? Okay, so that's a tangent. But we go and we receive communion after having made sure that we are cleansed, ready to receive the gifts that we are about to receive. Christ comes and dies and wipes out all sin, which completely takes away the gap that exists between us and God. He becomes the bridge, the ultimate bridge, okay, of humanity and God by destroying any possible from beginning of the world to the end of the world, any possibility of distance between us and God by his decision to die on the cross. He cleanses us all so that we, including those who were in Hades, by the way, okay? Because he does it once and for all, okay? He makes one sacrifice. And see, this is why it's so hard for us to say, is it possible that someone can be forgiven after they die? And my answer would be yes, because that's what happened to all of those who were in Hades, okay? Because of Jesus's atoning sacrifice, all right? But that sacrifice is only putting them into the state where they're ready to receive the real thing, which is entrance into paradise, okay? Because in that entrance, corruption has been annihilated. Death has been annihilated. Cancer has been annihilated. All of the horrible conditions of humanity have been annihilated. Okay? All of the things that would lead us into death have been taken away. That's why we say in that prayer of the Trasagin, all sickness, sorrow, and sighing have fled away. Because at that point, Jesus has wiped all that out because of his sacrifice. And because then he brings us into the final point. Does that make sense? Okay. I mean, it's when such... are your, I'm sorry. When are your sins forgiven then? I mean, do you have to confess your sins before you can reach a certain point? I thought that's. Confession. Part of confession is important for many reasons. I mean, the, the remember in the old, old days, um, I mean, think about the readings that we do out of the Acts of the Apostles, okay? I mean, they, they as soon as they were baptized, they changed their lives, okay? They sold all their stuff or whatever stuff they didn't sell, they put in the middle of the room for people to take as they needed, not as they wanted, not into excess, but into necessity. You take what you need, leave the rest for someone else, okay? Their lives completely changed. Okay, but also they were persecuted, right? So if all of us, you know, in our little gang, if all of us were in a position where we needed to make sure that we could trust one another, okay? Because as soon as we walk out that door, we run the risk of being turned in by somebody and being subject to death ourselves. And, you know, they got really creative with how to torture and kill people, right? Okay, so you needed to know that you trust people, right? Okay, well, what did they do? They confessed to one another. That's what they did. They got in the middle of the, because, you know, our liturgy is very formal, okay? But back in the day, they would just gather and they would have prayers and they would sing hymns and then they would have the communion meal, okay? Where they, you know, repeat the phrases that Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body, drink, eat, all this, this is my blood, and they would commune the body and blood of Jesus, okay, in a sacramental or in a worshipful way. And then they would have a common meal together, an agape meal that was bread and water, okay? But they would do all these things together. And they spent a lot of time together because they figured Jesus was coming soon, okay? So um, before they had the Eucharistic meal, they would stand up and they would say, I kicked a cat or I screamed at my mother-in-law or I, um, you know, stole a loaf of bread from the local market or whatever. And then they would announce their sins were forgiven in the name of Christ. And then they would commune, 
having cleansed themselves from any defilement of flesh of spirit. Okay. Remember that man that used to say, do that? What was his name? Offense. Offense, yeah. He used to do that in church. What's that? Stand up and say what, what he said. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Do you know why that stopped? Some of you do, because I've told you this. Well, he did it in Arabic, though. Oh, well, that makes it better. Well, that's, I'm, yeah. I'm still... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the reason why is because of um, a woman would stand up and confess that she had committed adultery or something like that. Her husband would grab her, take her out of the church, bring her to the, the city square and have her executed. Okay. <laughs> so once that happened, right, it didn't happen to the man, it just happened to the woman. So as soon as that happened, they changed it it's no longer public but the priest takes the role not of the of the of god or of a judge but of the people okay so the priest stands in place of the people because the priest is the keeper of the people his job is the liturgical propriety of the church he's not meant to be a governor he's not meant to be a politician he's not meant to be a judge He's meant to be the keeper of the time to make sure that liturgies are done properly and correctly. Okay. But um, somehow we've changed that around and I can explain that at some other point, but the, the, the priest then sits in the place of the people. We sit side by side and we'll sit across from somebody and say, okay, what did you do wrong? We talk and, and we walk together in this journey trying to get closer to the kingdom of heaven. Now, the idea of confession, repentance. Confession is the awareness that, and I'm not interested as a confessor, I'm not interested in things you've done wrong. Okay. It's not, I broke a law. I broke this law. I broke that law. I broke that law. Okay. It's how are you estranged from God? What is your impediment? What is keeping you away from God? A lot of times those impediments are, I broke this law, I broke that law, I broke that law, okay? But the more important condition is reconciliation back to God. It's not punishing you for what you did wrong. That's not what we're about. I've never in my life excommunicated anybody, I'm not allowed to anyway, okay? So we just need to keep that in mind as we go into confession the job is to get back on the path my job think we're like on railroad tracks okay and i'm right there and i've got this crane okay and i can take the crane lift it up and put you back on a track that gets you into a more heavenly you know heavenly direction okay that's that's the rule sometimes you got to go back and restart sometimes you just jump track or whatever but the point is getting you on the right path. Are there multiple paths? You bet there are, okay? You know, all of us could decide right now, probably God forbid, that we could become monastics, you know, and go off to a monastery somewhere and spend our lives in prayerful repentance. We could do that. That is one path, okay? It's an unlikely path, but it's a path, all right? And there are others, okay? So Confession is one thing. Repentance, that word in, in Greek, at least one of the words, is metania. Okay? It's not the touching your head on the, the floor. It's metania, not metania. It's metania. And metania literally means a change of the mind, a reorienting of the mind. Okay? And this, I think, is rather beautiful because we live our lives in a certain way, thinking, I, you know, I hate going this direction or I hate this person or I hate this thing. Reorienting your perspective is a way to adjust the way that you see things so that instead of seeing the things in front of you that you don't like, you look beyond those things towards God and the things that are truly beautiful and uplifting and helpful, the things that are holy, the things that drive you to want to praise God. Okay, so repentance is the process of getting from this point where we're kind of miserable with our current existence to where everything has some kind of, forgive the phrase, it's big, doxological content. Doxology meaning praising to God, giving praise to God. All right? Does that all make sense? Yes. Father, where does penance fit in with, with 
the with um metanoia and um uh -huh. um because in the west that's a big thing right every confession ha had a penance attached right. to because it. because humans are bad okay and because they're bad they have to be punished and the way you're punished is by giving penance okay now there are certain things like in our church if you you know and i'm not sure this is still in in play it depends on how the metropolitan decides to interpret our canons but if you get a divorce it's a year away from the chalice okay oh really? that's, your, that's that. your penance okay um metropolitan joseph wanted people to go longer than a year he he felt that it would up, be up to him to decide how long you stayed and for most people's longer than a year i think it would be really hard to keep people <laughs> <laughs> I think they'd end up becoming something else. I think it was six months. I think. Okay, so it's six months for some, you know, so it changes, but that's penance, okay? And also in our tradition, um, it's like $200. $200 and six months yeah, away from the chalice. Oh, my stars. <laughs> okay, well, let's let's not go down too far that road because, because in, in the current situation, I don't know how they handle it, okay? It's um, the that, money part that I find this. Well, and I understand. And but let's let's be honest. We're Americans, right? Yeah. Okay. What's the way you hurt an American? You fine them. Yeah, true. If you're if you're speeding down a road, you're doing 80 and a 55, you're gonna get a fine, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they understand the ways of our culture. So that's what happens. Now, you know, in our tradition, we have ways around that. And I'm not gonna get into that in a recorded video. Okay. So Judas would have repented. Yes. All right. On that same See, thing, thank you. Can, let me let me just talk about right, that really right. quick. Okay. Dante's Inferno. I have a real problem with that book. And I'll tell you why. Because there are two people in the lowest ring just below the devil. And by the way, the rings are down, not up. Okay. So the further down you go, the colder it gets. Not hotter. It's cold. Because the devil is a fallen angel and his wings are flapping so fast that he's freezing the very air around him. And right above him, encased in the ice that are a result of the flapping wings of the devil, are Brutus huh? and Brutus. Judas. Yep. A two. A two Brutus. Because Brutus betrayed Caesar. Judas betrayed Christ. So for Dante, they're exactly the same. And so it is the crime of betrayal that Dante sees as the most unforgivable of all sins. Okay? But... And somebody had to. Well, right. Jesus had to die. It all, it's the same thing with, you know, Christians being mad at Jews for killing Jesus. Absolutely not. He had to die. He had to die. They play the role and they played it perfectly. And that's all. There's nothing more to be said. So getting back to Judas, if Judas had repented in our view. Okay. So we compare Judas with Peter. Okay. Because Judas betrayed Jesus, but Peter denied Jesus to the point of anathema, to the point where he condemned Jesus. I don't know him. He spoke an oath and he says, I don't know the man. But what happens? Peter repents. Judas doesn't. So Judas dies unrepentant. And that's for us one of the most grievous sins there is. Peter didn't repent until he saw Jesus. He still repented. So I think he was still restored. <laughs> but think about that. No, there's nothing well, wrong with that. If he would sit down there. I there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. They're walking. Okay. You know, Jesus is there with a charcoal fire, right? right? Okay, he's restored. He's restored. I mean, what Peter did was horrible. Okay, and Jesus forgave. Oh, he forgave him. See, and that's that's what we've got to hold on to in our own understanding that the forgiveness way exceeds anything that we could possibly do. So the ultimate forgiveness could it be done? Could the devil repent? Yeah. The fathers talk about this. See, I think I read, Gregory Misa does. Because he was a spirit, he couldn't. 
but others said, yeah, that would be obviously yes. I mean, a spirit, what's the difference? If a spirit, I don't know. That part, I, I didn't know that. We, we call angels bodiless minds. Bodiless minds. Okay. Minds. Okay. Well, what are demons? Fallen angels. Right? So they're bodiless minds too. So, but in, in our belief, the, if he repented, yes, then what would happen? He'd be restored. Probably to his... Nobody would go to hell. That's a possibility. We can't rule it out. We can't say it wouldn't happen. We don't know. No, we don't. I know. I mean, the thing is, what what is there that creation has that could possibly be... Why would God throw away his own creation? That's right. But see, some people would say, just like Judas, somebody had to do the dirty deed. Right. So he's actually doing... A favor. So's the devil. God says God gave us free will. Right. Well, in order for free will, there has to be good and bad. Right okay. And left, up and All down. right. Okay. There has to be bad. So somebody got to do the dirty deed. Right. It's entirely possible. Everyone should live with the notion that it's possible, not likely, but possible that the okay. devil is saved. That Hitler is saved, that Osama bin Laden is saved. Not that they are, but right. that it's possible. It's possible. Right. Okay. Because otherwise, what does that make us? Judges. Okay. Which we cannot be. We can't be judges because we can't live up to our own judgments. Oh, that's true. Okay. We can't, you know, however we judge, I mean, Christ says this right between the eyes. He says, you will be judged in so far as you judge. Okay. I'd be Judge Roy being <laughs> the hanging judge. The hanging judge. <laughs> sure. Yeah. A lot of gun smoke. They hang it for any reason. <laughs> yeah, it's true, huh? You stole that horse? You yeah. hang him. Yeah. And the horse. Oh, wait, that's Blazing Saddles. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Oh, that's cool. It's powerful. That's but again, we don't live thinking that that's <clears throat> the truth. We live hoping, hoping that's the truth. Yes. Okay. Yes. Hoping. Absolutely. Dare we hope that all Christ that all shall be saved? Yes, we do. We do. Okay. Or, if you want to put it a different way, you're the only occupant of hell. That's that's a quick way to turn your view towards <laughs> repentance. That everyone else is saved except you. And I'm not saying you, I'm remember, saying me. I remember reading one years ago. That was explaining what his version of hell was floating at midnight in the North Atlantic. Mm. Uh, you know, treading water. Yeah. Oh yeah. I wouldn't so, like that. Sure. Forever. Yeah. I wouldn't that wouldn't happen. No moon. Right. The North Atlantic is one of the hardest places to experience. I don't yeah, know. I, 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 I've never I, been there, but I mean, it wow. Hit me like a brick. Yeah. Well, there are all sorts of interesting images in, well, in the Bible. I, if there were others around me, it ain't going to make hell any better. At least I won't feel as bad. The, the one I don't <laughs> like is the undying worm. Wow. That's yeah. very disturbing. I never heard it's in that. the Gospels. It's there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the undying worm. The unquenchable fire in the undying worm. That's pretty gross. Yeah. So um so getting back to your question, you see that it's necessary to be cleansed first. first. You cleanse the inside of the cup so that it can be able to receive that which is given. Okay, so we need to make sure that we have been cleansed. Jesus is the one. And that's the whole point. You've got to throw your sins to him. Okay, because you can't fix it yourself. He fixed it for you once and for all. And oh, by the way, um, for homework, read the epistle of, to the Hebrews from beginning to end. Okay, and be patient. All right, because it's dense. But when you get into the middle, you hear about Jesus being the chief priest, the high priest who goes into the Holy of Holies and makes the offering, but is both the one who is offering and who is the offering, the offerer and the offered. 
I actually say this in the liturgy, okay? And he is the one who goes, makes the sacrifice. He is the sacrifice, but he's also the priest offering the sacrifice. The high priest, and he does it once for all time. And so that liturgical event that's happening in heaven is exactly at the same time that he's on the cross. Dense, right? Yes. Tough stuff. <laughs> yep. Okay. But that, I mean, the, the epistle to the Hebrews, once you read that, to be perfectly blunt, I don't know how you could be anything other than Orthodox. You know, you can't, you can't look at the Christian faith. I mean, actually, what ends up happening is people say, I don't get anything out of the, the epistle of the Hebrews, except maybe about the cloud of witnesses and stuff that comes later. But they don't understand the liturgical part. But our liturgy is completely tied to the old practice of sacrifice in the Old Testament. And I forgot to bring that up. So I got two minutes. I might as well do it. Okay. The <laughs> sacrifices that were offered in the Old Testament were necessary to receive that forgiveness from God so you go on and live your daily life. So it could be an animal, um, a cow or a calf. It could be an oxen. It could be a, a bird, two turtle doves. It could be a griddle cake made of wheat and oil it could be any of those things but it was still a sacrifice that was made to establish or re-establish a correct relationship with god okay and what jesus does is he takes all that sacrificial stuff and he renders it unnecessary to his own perfect sacrifice again this is from the gospel to the gospel the epistle to the hebrews because jesus is perfect man right well the old sacrifices that were done were blemishless animals you couldn't offer a three-legged calf it had to be the best thing you had okay if you didn't give the best thing you had the sacrifice wouldn't be accepted okay well jesus is the best thing that humanity has to offer okay He's the best thing that humanity has to offer so he offers himself and because he does that all other need for sacrifice or that kind of restoration, gone. No need anymore. All wiped clean. You don't have to do that anymore. All we have to do is hold on to that. We say, I'm with, <laughs> literally, we say, I'm with him. That's what we do. I'm with him. Okay. And that's it. And that's it's it. Really, it's really beautiful that the when you look at the fact that the temple was physically destroyed, afterwards i mean right even right. jews can't have sacrifices anymore even though That's they right. might want to right it's exactly. very beautiful it is and we're the only ones offering a sacrifice and by the way we are offering a sacrifice that's completely legitimate because there's only one sacrifice that's still acceptable and that's a sacrifice of thanksgiving okay and what does the word eucharist mean oh that's a greek word that means thanksgiving Yeah, it's heavy stuff. Heavy lifting today for the Q&A. But good. Thank God. Um, trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to add to that. Yeah, the first um, seven chapters of Leviticus. So you can see all the different kinds of sacrifices that were necessary for fixing whatever problem you had in the Old Testament. And then taking a look at the epistle to the Hebrews and how that completely reorients and i love that word reorients one's approach to realize that jesus is the ultimate sacrifice once and for all there's nothing that we can do or need to do to restore our relationship with god it's already been done okay and the word reorient again because i like to play literally literally means to face east and who are we oh we're the eastern orthodox because we're facing east where we pray so when we face east we're reorienting ourselves okay any other questions good all right well thank you god bless you we're going to start with orthodoxy 101 i don't know if it's going to be next week or not but we'll i'll make sure everyone is well aware and we'll just go from there orthodoxy 101 with uh, vespers orthros and divine liturgy Okay?
Sounds good. All right. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.